It's the Maxwell Institute Podcast. I'm Blair Hodges. Joseph Smith, the founding prophet of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, died at the hands of an angry mob in June of 1844. Shortly before his death, he's reported to have made this bold declaration. I should be like a fish out of water if I were out of persecutions. The Lord has constituted me so curiously that I glory in persecution. Dr. Adam Powell of Durham University has written a book on opposition faced by Joseph Smith and early Latter-day Saints. He argues that like early Christians of the second century, the opposition faced by early Mormons played a major role in shaping their theology. The idea that humans can become gods appeared in a setting of extreme opposition, both for early Mormons like Joseph Smith and early Christians like Irenaeus. In this episode, Dr. Powell joins us to talk about his book, Irenaeus, Joseph Smith, and God-Making Heresy. Dr. Powell's a junior research fellow in the Department of Theology and Religion at Durham University, and he joined us at the Maxwell Institute here at BYU in Provo, Utah, where he also delivered a lecture on the subject. And if you missed the lecture, you'll be able to watch it on the Institute's YouTube channel. We're talking about how opposition helps shape theology with Adam Powell in this episode of the Maxwell Institute podcast. Send questions and comments about this and other episodes to mipodcast at byu.edu. And don't forget to rate and review the show on iTunes. Dr. Adam J. Powell joins us today on the Maxwell Institute podcast. Thank you so much for being here today. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's great to have you here. You, you're actually here at Brigham Young University, and you just delivered a talk here. Today we're going to be talking about your book, Irenaeus, Joseph Smith, and God-Making Heresy. Let's start off by talking about heresy in general, the common definition. Um, yeah. In John Locke's letter concerning toleration, he wrote that every church is orthodox to itself, but to others, erroneous or heretical. And you note in the book that heresy for the heretic is orthodoxy. So let's begin with the common understanding of what heresy is, because your book actually differs from that. Right. So in a sense, the, the I would say the common understanding of heresy could be defined as something like deviation from the truth or from something called orthodoxy by insiders themselves. So in this sense, heretics are kind of what the sociologist Lester Kurtz has called deviant insiders. So I think that that's kind of, yeah, that, that's roughly the, the basic kind of traditional Christian theological notion of, of heresy. Yeah, so it comes from the inside and it's based on truth claims that differ from it, it's in contrast with orthodoxy or the correct belief, right, right? Right, But your book differs. Here's a quote from you. You say, heresy in its most basic sense consists in opposition from any or all directions against the solidarity, identity, and existing worldview of a collective. Unpack this different idea of heresy. And I'm also interested to know how you arrived at this new proposed definition. So on the one hand, that definition that you quoted of mine is just a working definition. So that that is, it's a formulated kind of definition that's that's constructed in a certain way to represent what is ideal, typical, uh, and useful within the analytical framework of my study. So so that's kind of on the one hand, I'm intentionally creating a working operational definition that may not, in fact, make sense outside of the analytical framework of the book. Um, but on the other hand, I arrived at that definition uh, really in two ways. One is by looking at both the original uh, meaning of heresis. So uh, this, this term originally meant essentially to choose, and then it pretty quickly became this notion of to choose an alternative philosophy or something. So heresis was to choose something else kind of idea. And then the other thing I looked at was the actual social processes at work that force religious in-groups to articulate and defend this thing they call orthodoxy. So when you start looking at, well, what are the actual social processes at play here? It becomes pretty quickly evident that heresy, as it's being attributed to certain ideas or the, the term heretic to certain individuals, that in fact, historically and socially, that is actually rarely some kind of deviation from something that already e exists as orthodoxy. Um, so, the, so a good example would be something like with like Irenaeus or Athanasius or some of these early church fathers. They're called heresiologists. 
But in a way, they're actually engaged in constructing this thing that becomes orthodoxy. Yeah, they're the ones rooting out the heresy. The heresiologists are like going on the hunt for heresy. Right. And so in, and in doing so, they're in fact in the business of constructing orthodoxy, which tells me as someone more coming at it from a kind of more social scientific angle that tells me that this thing called orthodoxy didn't pre-exist or predate this thing being labeled heresy. Um, so that's kind of so that's kind of the two sides as, as I was sort of saying. There's that, and then there's this aspect of how heresis at the time kind of just meant to choose an alternative, not necessarily an insider alternative, just an alternative philosophical school, for instance. And in a religious context, that makes sense. I think people will be able to wrap their head around that. Do you see any parallels in academic enterprises, in the construction of academic orthodoxies and, and heresies, so to speak? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that, that what happens is, I mean, uh, an example that immediately comes to mind actually would be something like the kind of German philosophical debates about epistemology. So if you go back to Kant and um, idealism and and uh, these kinds of things. What is it to know? How do we know? Yeah, and so what th is it? those debates were, were kind of raging because there was force from outside saying, what's the value of philosophy, right? So, so it's in, in this external force being applied on the discipline itself that you then start engaging and constructing, well, here's what philosophers think, or here's, here's what it means to have a kind of a, a, a canon of, of philosophical classics or something like that. So to kind of sum all of that up, the common idea of heresy is being something coming from the inside in opposition to truth. You invert that and talk about heresy in terms of opposition from any, it could be from inside or from outside or from wherever, opposition rather than false beliefs or different beliefs. It's, it's more about opposition. One more thing about the word though, it seems like you're swimming upstream to use the word heresy already, like right, right off the bat. Did you think <laughs> right. about that when you're uh, you, yeah. selecting a term? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, I mean, I, I would say, you know, on the, on the one hand, it's it was exciting to to just have this kind of thought experiment. You know, what what if we reframed heresy? What if we uh, I've described it before as kind of lifting heresy as a category or concept out of theological moorings? What if, you know, what if it wasn't relegated to historical theology, but in a sense, I, I mean, I wasn't, I wasn't the first to do this. Um, so, I mean, you, you think back to something like Walter Bauer and, and what's now called the Bauer thesis, um, which, you know, he's writing early 20th century, I believe. Um, and he's, he's basically saying, you know, that what became orthodoxy is what just simply the option that won out. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is a kind of famous thing. Uh, it's been picked up um, most popularly by Bart Ehrman. Yep. But so I was kind of, you know, following somewhat closely that kind of idea, but looking at with what happens with new religious movements and what happens when they're opposed and face opposition on a number of fronts. Um, and it's And then in the process of adapting to that opposition, they come to express a more highly developed doctrinal kind of system. So in my research, I began to see that the category of heresy could be useful for capturing that sort of religiously inflected opposition that catalyzes orthodoxy. So I was curious about, you know, could heresy be a useful category for social scientists who are who are seeing a particular type of religiously inflected opposition faced by religious groups in their nascent stages that is sort of recognizable in at least in one sense because it catalyzes orthodoxy i think this speaks to something very interesting about academic approaches to religion in general and that's that they require some level of buy-in on the part of people who mm. are reading the work or other scholars who are interacting with the work mm. People could, at the outset, just say, "Well, I don't want to. I don't want to use heresy that way, mm -hmm. so I'm really not going to engage." Other people could say, "See, this is an interesting expansion of that term. Yeah. Um, it's kind of a gamble. <laughs> it's kind of a, yeah, it is, a risk. Yeah. You're, you're risking uh, people either not wanting to play along or people misunderstanding. But the hope would be, it seems, that people would be able to accept the terms and then follow the analysis and make their criticisms on that level rather than sort of yeah at the level right. of these terms." Yeah, that's right. And and I think that that I was speaking to to and sort of for 
a kind of social science audience and knowingly not really a, a theological mm -hmm. audience. So, you know, I'm, I'm fully aware of what I'm doing and, I, and, I'm, and I'm not trying to kind of commandeer this term and, and, and use it differently uh, for any kind of, uh, you know, uh, nefarious reason, <laughs> but, <laughs> oh. but, uh, you know, believe it or not, <laughs> but I do think that when you look at, again, like the heresiologists of the early church, again, from, from a perspective that's attuned to social tensions and social processes there, it was always really about identifying significant threats and not really in a in meaning not uh simply about kind of doctrinal correct ideas yeah yeah something. correct yeah. ideas or, or sort of you know for Irenaeus he, he constantly is talking about the rule of faith and the and these these heretics have devi deviated from yeah. this rule of faith and yes on the kind of rationalistic theological side yeah it's sure it's about that but there are social dynamics at work mm -hmm. and to call someone a heretic or to call their ideas heresy or the school of thought heresy was was really about pointing to them and saying you are a significant threat right to a, to a, any kind of cohesive uh, sense of unity or solidarity and so those threats are not always from the inside but in every other way can look precisely the same. And so do the same type of thing. Yeah, exactly. And so I was so I was trying to say that, you know, heresy in this kind of socially informed sense would include deviation from the inside. But more than that, it would also be the threats from outside that in every other way look precisely the same as those from the inside. And you distinguished between like social science type of approach versus theological mm. type of approach. In a nutshell, how would you distinguish those two groups for people who aren't familiar with those particular fields? What what separates them? So there are all sorts of you know hot debates raging about uh, about these kind of disciplinary tensions and, and things. We can settle them all right now. Yeah. So so, <laughs> so we'll so I'll do my best. But I, I mean, I think at the most basic level. Uh, of you know, kind of disciplinary level, sociology is going to differ from theology in its kind of epistemological presuppositions concerning the supernatural or the what we might call the supra empirical as a source of knowledge. So, like could you rely on a claimed revelation from God? Yeah. For, so, so yeah. I think from my perspective, it's actually not so much about the reality or or claims about the existence of the supernatural or super empirical it's about it's this epistemological difference about can something called divine revelation be a source of of information or knowledge for the academic enterprise or not you know and so i think so kind of a that level i think theology differs from so social science really in that social science is going to see revelation as uh, another bit of data for analysis and it seems like that could even be agnostic as well in terms of like a social scientist approach could bracket the idea of god and not say god doesn't necessarily exist but that that's just not part of the discussion right, right now. or it could say take on a naturalistic mm -hmm. metaphysic and say no we, we don't believe that and we're doing this type of yeah. analysis so i yeah. i think that's an important distinction to make that people can be doing social science research that sort of brackets the idea of god without making claims about god's involvement or god's existence or they could make claims and sure. just say they don't accept right. them, yeah. Yeah, I mean, in this, you know, it makes me think, in mid-20th century kind of debates, I mean, I've, I think immediately of, of uh, kind of this debate between Ninian Smart and Peter Berger, which was literally Ninian Smart saying, no, you know, social scientists need to adopt methodological agnosticism, and Peter Berger saying, no, it needs to be methodological atheism. And they had their, their reasons for doing so. But I, but I think, as, as I see it, the main difference is this epistemological presupposition that, that revelation from the supra-empirical kind of realm or level can either be a valid source of knowledge for scholarship, or it cannot be, and it, at best it would be a kind of another phenomenon to study. Mm. Yeah, okay. So in the book, you're taking this sociological approach to examine early Mormonism in comparison to uh, ancient early Christians, and you're arguing that the sort of opposition that these groups faced 
made a significant impact on the plan of salvation that they embraced mm. or that they taught, particularly the idea that humans can become gods. And we talked about how sociological approaches kind of differ from theological approaches. How, are there many differences between sociological approaches and more straightforward historical approaches? What's different between telling a history right. of these ideas versus taking a sociological approach? I mean, in a sense, I would say for this kind of analysis that I'm doing, which is what you might call a sociologically informed historical analysis, um, I would say the line between between that and the work of a historian is really th very thin. Um, and in fact, I, I think I would probably be called a historian depending on the context. So yeah, so I don't I don't see quite as significant of a difference between the work of historians and the work of sociologists as I do between the work of theologians and the work of social scientists. Mm. Now, if anything, it may be simply that historians are kind of at their best when they're uncovering the minutia of the past in, in sort of in order to reconstruct the wider narrative. And sociologists who engage in this kind of historical analysis may be at their best when they're using that data that was uncovered by historians to highlight social or political or religious kind of patterns. But I think particularly as of late, I think the line has been blurred quite a bit and there's some fantastic, his, his, you know, historians doing some fan, fantastic work that borrows from social theory and vice versa. I think there are some, though maybe relatively few of us who are kind of more steeped in social science, but who are like, who enjoy at least applying that to historical cases. Okay, that makes sense. It seems like the, the voice of a book written in the genre of history might be more narrative and have less of the the superstructure like mm -hmm. with the sociological yeah. approach you can really see like you leave a lot of the scaffolding up about yeah. your assumptions and about the theory that you're applying to the historical yeah. data that and you try to let that drive the conclusions and historians and books of history seem to come across I mean, they're more enjoyable to read for a lot of people, frankly, because yeah. they don't have yeah. that extra scaffolding. That's right. But then at the same time, you might not see uh, as much how the historian has gone about making the decisions that the that the historian made. So. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, I think I, when I say historians are at their best when they're uncovering minutia in service of a kind of narrative, I, that's definitely my personal opinion because I, I do tend to actually find some historical work to be less compelling when when they try to u utilize too much kind of social theory without constructing or or indicating up front what you know what the the scaffolding is going to mm -hmm. be uh or what you know any kind of presuppositions they may hold so so every now and then i, I do find some you know some historical work less compelling precisely because they didn't just lay that out there and, and kind of outline the theoretical uh, ideas or for the framework. So yeah, I think it's probably mostly fair to say that, that that's one of the differences. Yeah. One of the books that I think best kind of splits that divide is probably Massacre at Mountain Meadows um, mm. by Ron Walker and I think I think Glenn Leonard and uh, and Richard Turley. Mm. They're telling a history, but they're taking a theoretical framework and sort of mm. putting it on top of that. So if people want to see another book that sort of splits that divide, I would, I would recommend that one. But we're talking about with Adam Powell about his book, Irenaeus, Joseph Smith, and God Making Heresy. And as I mentioned a moment ago, you're examining early Mormonism and some early Christians and talking about how the opposition that they faced impacted the theologies that they ended up teaching. So you talk about three different types of opposition in the book. There's doctrinal, personal, and societal. What are some examples of how those play out? Yeah, so this was, you know, as these things tend to be, a kind of artificial separation uh, of the, the types of opposition facing early Christians and early Mormons. But so that it's just simply so that it's, it kind of is easier to see paper. Um, so the doctrinal is what you th might think it would be. This would be opposition faced by these groups from religious competitors uh, and typically in relation to beliefs and kind of uh, rational kind of arguments about, although they may take on a kind of polemical tone, but they, but they are kind of arguments about teachings, uh, about sacred texts. 
Like they're, um, the Bible canon is closed versus here's this new scripture. Right. That should be yeah. Yeah. So yeah, with early Mormonism, yeah, the perfect example is like Alexander Campbell's kind of attack on the Book of Mormon. So that's what I'm I'm viewing that loosely as doctrinal opposition in that it is uh, sort of unashamedly and overtly a challenge to the teachings and, be and religious beliefs of the new group by religious competitors from, from outside. What kind of doctrinal ones did the early Christians face? That's sort of a comparison. Oh yeah. So, I mean, you had, you had a lot of, of opposition to what they were saying about this person, Jesus. Um, so you think of something like Celsus and, and Origen and their kind of debate. And, you know, for, for Celsus, basically, it, he's, he's basically arguing that your teachings about Jesus just don't make sense. Uh, and he's using, he's using existing philosophical categories to show why he thinks that just doesn't make sense. Um, so he's kind of saying if it's, if he's a, a God, that's one thing. If he's a man, that's another thing. If he's a God man, then, then is he, is this some kind of angel or is the, you know, and he's trying to, you see him kind of struggling to make sense of it, but at the same time, very much attacking the belief. And, and, and so this is, this absolutely then you know, initiates origins writings. Um, so that would be a perfect example of how is this external force, it's, it's doctrinal in nature, but it's causing an insider to have to really formulate more concrete ideas about what they believe. Okay, how about the societal opposition? That's uh, the second category, doctrinal, personal and societal. What about societal? What does that look like for Mormons and also for early Christians, mm, yeah. an example of that? Yeah, so societal, uh, this is where I get into things like um, attempts to label the group. What are they? Who are these people? And attempts to kind of make sense of the fact that they're kind of viewed as outsiders. That, that is, early Mormons and early Christians are viewed as outsiders uh, in their respective environments. Um, and then also like accusations of social subversion. And so... Like they're a threat to democratic values. Right. Or yeah. Like so, I mean, this is where... I was really struck by the similarities um, between between, the bet between and... Er, yeah early Mormons and early Christians, which I'm defining, by the way, early Mormonism I'm defining as Joseph Smith's tenure, so the first 14 years, and for early Christians um, I'm really looking, really zooming in on second century Christians, particularly in Gaul, and kind of using Irenaeus as a representative. But I mean, yeah, so some examples of that would be the way in which for, so for early Christians, uh, they're, they're being opposed and, and told that their practices or their unwillingness to be involved in kind of the civil religion of the empire, that that is socially subversive that you, you know, participating in like pagan sacrifices and yeah, festivals. Exactly. And yeah. And, and sort of bowing down to the. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So some of the kind of the, the kind of rituals involved. Like us pledging allegiance in the United States R to the flag sort of. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So yeah, exactly. So if you, if you resisted that, that's going to be typically not interpreted in terms of doctrine, mm -hmm. but interpreted in terms of kind of this social subversion. Are yeah. you, are you a threat to the, the status quo? Yeah. To the body politic. Or something. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Jehovah's um, Witnesses still face a lot of this in other countries uh, because yeah. you know, the pacifists yeah. and things like this. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Um, so, and then, yeah, and so you had that with our Christians. So, I mean, the Roman Empire, you've got the, the you know, Pax Deorum and the, and the Pax Romana are tied together. The, 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 you had to appease the gods in order to kind of have peace mm -hmm. in the empire. And so then you have this group calling themselves Christians who are not willing to do that. They're not willing to participate, which could be a problem. So you got that kind of that kind of thing. You have the other one that I think is striking because it's similar is you have early Christians being uh, attacked in terms of labels, right? So they no one is willing to call early Christians a religion because that would give them kind of legitimacy. So they call them, you know, superstitio, a superstition, or they call them, I mean, Galen finally late kind of 20th century calls them a philosophy or a philosophical school. Even that is sort of a, a step toward legitimacy. I mean, for the most part, it's kind of, they're a superstition or they're a, some kind of strange cult. They're atheists even like they were, you know, yeah, they're atheists, they're cannibals. Yeah. Um, 
and this kind of thing. So with early Mormonism, you got much the same stuff. You've got people saying that they're superstition, literally using the exact same word, that it's folk magic, um, that they're imposters, they're outsiders, and, and yeah, and that sort of thing. So I mean, you got Theocrats, very similar. Theocrats, like yeah, political yeah, government yeah, questions. Yeah, so exactly. And, you know, and I, and I'm, I mentioned, you know, that some of this is based on behavior. So like with early Mormonism, they do engage in this kind of on block voting in Missouri. Well, you know, if you're doing block voting, it's not a stretch to then be accused of kind of subverting democracy or right. something, but it's just a matter of, you know, how that's interpreted by the in group. Yeah. And, and who, and who has the social power to make the labels and yeah, make the labels yeah. matter? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, one thing I, I point to in the book is, is, uh, that's interesting, I think, is for both groups in their kind of respective environments, you know, for both of them, they represent less than 1% of the population, um, far less. In fact, I think it's like two hundredth of a percent of the population. So, yeah, I mean, you've got some serious power dynamics going on with the societal opposition. So that's doctrinal and societal. How about personal opposition? What are some examples of that? Yeah, so so I kind of use interchangeably personal or physical uh, opposition, which I really just mean the actual kind of violence uh, against or opposition against the personal well-being, physical well-being uh, of th these communities. So this is actually pretty straightforward. I mean, so for early Christians, second century, you do have persecution, you know, Christians being taken and, and, and killed in the Colosseum and, and you get this kind of martyrdom, what's interpreted by the in-group anyway as martyrdom. And then for early Mormons, uh, just an abundance of examples, but, but you've got things like anything from, you know, Joseph Smith being tarred and feathered to Mormons being completely as a group expelled from Missouri, got loss of life, you've got possessions being burned or, or livestock being shot or, I mean, so you've got all kinds of attacks on the kind of the personal well-being. So we've got doctrinal, personal, and societal. And again, these are opposition and in your book are referred to as heresy, this sort of mm. opposition that these groups are encountering. You also point to three phases that the, that the group itself goes through as mm. they're facing opposition. You talk about the reception, the recognition, and the resolution. Why is that component necessary for your study? Yeah. Again, it was a kind of uh, breaking things down into a, an outline to just simply to, to help make the argument. And I, I, I state repeatedly that in a way, these three reception, recognition, resolution are not it's not as though they're non-overlapping. Uh, I mean, these these are on February first. We yeah, received no, exactly. On March second. Yeah, we recognized. and I think, and I had to be really careful of that because I mean, I think when you are applying <laughs> social theory to historical cases, it's very easy to do a very heavy-handed analysis. Um, one reason is, is there's just no one to cry foul, right? I mean, <laughs> um, so so in a way, I wanted to be very careful to say these aren't really like sequential steps mm -hmm. um these are just kind of a way of, of kind of breaking out three sort of elements to the way in which opposition is integrated yeah. into beliefs like when you're on the receiving end of it how yeah how so i mean add. so i roughly kind of followed a, a couple other ideas i mean one was you have this anthrop anthropologist victor turner who has this kind of idea of like the pre-liminal and the liminal oh, and, yeah. the, and the post-liminal and um, and, and then like, uh, on the psychological side, Leon Festinger, um, with cognitive dissonance, the idea of cognitive dissonance, where he studied a, a kind of new religious movement, um, in the mid 20th century. And, and, you know, it looks at how there are these, these kind of, fa yeah, phases is probably a good term. They're kind of phases of what, what's gone through collectively when they're faced with opposition. So with reception, this is a essentially the opposition happening. Um, so either like pamphlets being published against them, a house getting burned down, or yeah. uh, accusations being leveled about your, how yeah. you're impacting society negatively or something. Yeah, exactly. So you sort of have these things just transpiring. And I mean, just put very briefly, that pretty much is what I mean by reception. Um, so this is just kind of the, the, the initial experience itself. Um, but recognition is when there's, th this is the first steps towards sort of as a collective, having a, a collective awareness 
that this opposition just happened, that it's maybe not going anywhere, and that it must be dealt with in some sense. Uh, it's kind of where I would say, in a way, it's it's where the opposition kind of seeps into the collective consciousness. Um, so it's it's literally recognizing it for what it is. Oh, you know, I, I've res restored the truth. I've you know, I've produced this this ancient text, the Book of Mormon, for example. But, you know, some people don't seem to be receiving that very well, right? Um, <laughs> yeah. So, so it's kind of this this kind of initial oh, and and I think as a group um, now it may not be you know even evenly distributed across the board, but but you have at least for like or early Mormons, you've got kind of a, an inner group, inner core kind of group of leaders, emerging leaders, and they're starting to realize that there will need to be some approach to this opposition and then and that you want vary. to account for it like why it's happening in the context of your beliefs mm -hmm. and then what maybe what to do about it yeah yeah exactly and and so and then that goes into the the third which is resolution so so which in, what, what's interesting and the reason i say these very much overlap is that i mean if you just look at the first 14 years of mormonism uh for example and the strategies used or the, the reactions to the opposition differ at different times. And you, I mean, you have, you, you could have, for instance, tension breaking out in Missouri between Mormons and non-Mormons and Joseph Smith uh, producing a revelation that says we need to address our non-Mormon neighbors peacefully, you know, then, then, you know, a few years later, you may have something like uh, the Danites who are who you know are are following at least some of the mormon leadership in taking a much more aggressive approach to dealing with non-mormons and so i mean it, it varies it's not it's not like like we said that it's not that there's just this awareness oh you know people don't like us or something and then and then they get together and they write up the grand strategy for how to deal with that is it's much more fluid than that and Adam, then what you do is you're looking at, so you're looking at these types of oppositions and how they play out on the inside and then how they impacted what seems to be similar kind of theology about humans becoming gods. You're seeing this emerge amongst early Mormons and amongst early Christians. So in both of these cases, you're suggesting that in some ways this heresy or this outside opposition can result in a similar kind of salvation scheme. So talk about that, how that plays out in the book then. Yeah, so I think what what I do in the book is once I've once I have outlined those three kind of phases, really for the rest of the book, I then am looking at the resolution, the resolution phase, because what I'm particularly interested in is how the experiences relate to the beliefs and the developing beliefs, and so the argument goes essentially that the way in w or one major way in which uh, the opposition is resolved is through the construction of these what i'm calling in the book sal salvation schemas um, but these are kind of I'm, I, with that term i'm trying to get at something that's more than just meta narrative so it, it's kind of meta it's sort of one part meta narrative uh, but it's also got this kind of pragmatic animating mobilizing kind of aspect in the here and now um, so it kind of frame it frames your experiences, it frames your behavior, it frames your ritual life within the community, as well as your kind of myth or, or narrative. So essentially, I think for both early Christians and early Mormons, I mean, even the terminology, first of all, is really interesting. So, so with Irenaeus, he he comes up with or kind of outlines what he calls the economy of salvation. And he's, and this is where we actually get oikonomia is eventually we get dispensation from it. And dispensation, of course, is a common term in 19th century America and is incorporated into to Mormonism as well. Um, and then, of course, Joseph Smith really develops mostly after uh, his martyrdom. But, but you get this idea of the plan of salvation or sometimes called the, the plan of ha great plan of happiness. But you've got so you got economy of salvation, plan of salvation. Both of them mean what I'm what I'm describing. They both mean a kind of salvation history. Um, they both mean God's sort of divine plan for His creation. 
Um, but they also mean sort of what does the community itself need to do, what mobilizes it, what gives it a sense of purpose, how do they connect kind of past, present, and future. So yeah, so with deification then, this is a key component for both uh, Irenaeus and kind of his, his early Christians and uh, Joseph Smith, at least by you know the last year or two of, of his life, you get this kind of notion some kind of idea that in these these large kind of salvation schemes that people are progressing towards something called godhood and that, that and i think this is key that that is more than just doctrine okay that it's more than just a nice tidy belief about the future or about kind of metaphysical possibility or something it's a motivating identity for right now and a way of seeing the past as connected to the future through what you're doing in the present and so for both of them then in these kind of soteriologies they emphasize things like uh, the use of your agency they both talk about using your agency to choose right over wrong to choose god obedience to god's commandments uh, over disobedience and to choose to endure persecution both of them highlight and, and strongly emphasize that there will be kind of justice in the future but that right now the, the best you can do is kind of endure persecution uh with an awareness of that future justice that will come so they they develop these ideas alongside the idea of progressing unto godhood kind of thing so so i think in doing that, it's it. They happen to resolve precisely the types of oppositions they were facing. So they no longer have to worry about kind of are they a legitimate religion because now they literally are the unique uh, kind of agent in God's plan for the world. Um, they don't have to you know worry about. Um, whether their truth claims are, are right or not, because the, what they need to do is endure persecution. They don't have to worry about the persecution because there will be future justice for those who are pers persecuting them. Um, so that's kind of the way in which I think the opposition be becomes kind of incorporated or integrated into their beliefs and that resolves the opposition. That's Adam J. Powell. He's a junior research fellow in the Department of Theology and Religion at Durham University. And today we're here talking about his book, Irenaeus, Joseph Smith, and God-Making Heresy. So now that we have a general idea of the comparison that you make, the question becomes why compare these particular two examples? Are you suggesting that this kind of opposition will result in these type of theologies or why select these two examples if it doesn't always wind up this way? Yeah. How would you respond to questions about the comparative approach in general? Right. Yeah, so so I see that as two questions. So, I mean, why compare these two? Because I think they are both striking examples of something very, very similar happening. Does that mean that it's inevitable that, that any new kind of nascent... Uh, religious movement facing these sort of three types of opposition will come to embrace deification? Of course not. Um, of course not. So in a sense, why can, I mean, I was, I was comparing them really because of, I had this question, why does anyone come to embrace deification as a community? And really this study sort of had its early birth in a different study which was a theological comparison many years ago now but and and so i had the kind of theological philosophical answer to that uh, or answer to the comparison which was essentially you know no they kind of differ on ontological categories and they're not exactly saying the same thing philosophically but i found that really insufficient from the kind of socio-cultural perspective because I wanted to know, well, why, if the, these are two different groups, two different times and places, sure, they, you know, they share some cultural inheritance, but really, I wanted to know, well, why would, why would they come to similar ideas at all? You know, why, why would we have statements from Irenaeus or, or Athanasius or, or something like that? that sounds so strikingly similar to statements by Lorenzo Snow or Joseph Smith or something like that. And, and so I, 
it was the comparative kind of social scientific approach that I think allowed me to get at an answer to that question, which was that they faced similar types of opposition. And I, and I'm someone who's going to say there, there are a limited number of options for humans as they in, in, in kind of face the human experience. Um, so I don't think it's inevitable. I don't think every group, there are examples, uh, that I could point to of groups that didn't embrace a similar belief. Um, so that's, I think your first question. Um, but yeah, I mean, as far as the comparative method, I mean, this is obviously a hot topic, mm -hmm. uh, at, at, among some anyway, in the social sciences. In fact, when I was defending this, this started out as my doctoral research. And when I it came time to defend this, this was the first question I was asked was, hmm. was defend the comparative method. Um, <laughs> so that um, just got right, you know, just right to the put, me, put me at ease. Yeah. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so yeah, so very briefly, let me try to do that. I mean, so I think comparing these two cases does precisely what comparison always does. It directs our attention to particular elements of those cases. So certain phenomena, certain experiences, certain emotions, really kind of anything. Um, but it, but it points us to specific elements of the cases by indicating what is definitely not unique to one of the two cases and what may perhaps be unique to one of the two. So in this way, I think comparison necessarily shapes the analysis. Uh, because the, the it's the juxtaposition of the two uh, that provides the the kind of the relief needed to see those elements. Now that's also precisely why the comparative method is unpopular mm -hmm. sometimes because it can kind of tend toward generalizing. Uh, because in a, in addition to highlighting what is perhaps unique to each of the two, it does highlight what they share. So in that, in that sense, you, you, in other words, can see more clearly what they share. And so it can kind of lead toward generalizing. There's this parallelomania type yeah, phenomenon. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, likewise there it's, a, there's kind of a lack of freedom in comparison, right? Because it, it is sort of telling you what to see in a sense. And now in the past, I think, uh, I mean, I think the, we, I think particularly in anthropology, we have been burned by this. And I think that's, I mean, I think that's why there's a, a reluctance to engage in comparison. Uh, because I think in, in the past, it, it led to some unfortunate kind of generalizations about, you know, and, and, and attempts to construct kind of universal theories. Mm -hmm. And uh, like colonialism becomes a problem, like people right. putting yep. ideas onto other cultures, flattening them out, erasing differences. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And so, and I think it was, uh, again, if you're talking kind of late 19th, early 20th century, I, mean, I think it was a, a relatively, it lacked, we'll say, self-awareness or, yeah. or reflexivity. So, so that you would come up with things like, you know, world religions, mm -hmm. uh, salvation religions, categories like sacred texts, or even sometimes scripture, the, the idea of scripture. Uh, well, yeah, you start judging texts based on a Christian idea of what scripture should be. And that becomes this right, category that right. then warps the other things that it's studying. Right, so exactly. So, I mean, so you, you get some of that from comparison, but um, but one thing that I've told my students before is that kind of in, in defense of comparison is that there's nothing common without comparison. Okay. So if one's careful and reflexive and sort of willing to acknowledge differences and the cultural grounding of the phenomena that's under investigation, comparison is still really useful. And, and I would actually argue unavoidable. But but maybe we can save that for another time. But I mean, I think cognitively speaking, um, w we really couldn't function without comparison. Um, you wouldn't have any categories at all. Uh, you wouldn't have language or indeed the ability to learn language. Um, yeah, what is comparison other than relation? Yeah. And relation yeah. Is, exi is existence. Um, yeah. So, I mean, yeah. so, you know, t so, I mean, there is that, you know, I've got a, I've got a four year old at home and, and you comparison, I can tell you is precisely how you learn everything uh, at that age. Um, yeah. So, so comparison, I think in a sense is just an inbuilt kind of aspect of, of human cognition. But, but I think that the point of course being, um, 
the careful comparison is something of a kind of bulwark against incessantly spinning our wheels as scholars uh, because it has this potential to inform categories and patterns and genuine differences and i think i think there is if you i think you can uh, avoid it and go too far in your avoidance of comparison so that you're incessantly reinventing the wheel kind mm -hmm. of because you're not aware of of similarities across time and that sort of thing yeah i wanted to ask as well about a striking difference that you noticed so we've talked about some similarities between early christians and early mormons mm. were, were there any particular things as you did the comparison that stuck out as like a clear difference between the theologies that irenaeus and joseph smith propounded yeah i mean so i think it, differences are are very important uh, in this comparison i mean and one one difference actually has to do with the material available, which I, I mentioned in the book. And, and I would say, you know, toward the end of the book, end up f focusing more on Mormonism because of this. And I, and I say that's why I'm doing doing so. But, I mean, one difference is simply when we're, you're talking about Irenaeus, you've got – there's some question over whether he wrote this one particular letter uh, about martyrdom. If he didn't, then you literally only have his kind of polemical, apologetic kind of writings that seemingly are motivated by, you know, a, this desire to lay out a kind of rational defense uh, against Valentinians. So you've got this one kind of text, and it's a particular genre and has a particular agenda, uh, and it's for a particular audience. With Mormonism, of course, you've got all sorts of documents, uh, and it's actually really wonderful. <laughs> uh, I mean, there's, there's sort of no end to what yeah, you could look at. Kind of an embarrassment of riches at some um, point. And so, that, I mean, that's sort of the one difference from, from the, the methodological perspective. But, I mean, uh, yeah, so, I mean, a difference that, I, that stood out to me is that you have, I guess, related to, what I, to, to the genre is simply that with Joseph Smith, you have less of a clear-cut uh, sort of construction of orthodoxy in relation to opposition that you would with Irenaeus. So, so if we looked at, for instance, the, the, the way I broke down the doctrinal, societal, uh, um, and personal forms of opposition, in a way, one way to, to put it would be to say, with Irenaeus, doctrinal is, is the major category. And with with early Mormonism, it's kind of all of them uh, fairly equally. But if anything, I would say doctrinal fades a little bit into the background, in fact, uh, which I think is somewhat counterintuitive and people don't realize that. But I mean, I think it's actually the societal and the personal that is much more pronounced. So I think there are those differences. Of course, we could talk about all kinds of kind of sociocultural differences as far as the two contexts. They share some, you know, cultural norms and inheritances, but of course, you know, this is a different time. It's a different type of pluralism in the Roman Empire. It's a different type of social hierarchy at play with different types of power dynamics. So, I mean, there's all sorts of differences if you want to start just laying out particulars about their context mm -hmm. you know yeah, yeah that I, I think that that gives people a good sense of uh, of some of the differences that, uh, that you also talk about in the book the book is called Irenaeus Joseph Smith and God making heresy by Adam J Powell the last thing I wanted to do was talk about the idea of elasticity. In the conclusion hmm. of the book, you introduce readers to this idea of elasticity. And it's something that you also talked about in your recent uh, Maxwell Institute guest lecture. Give us a sense for what you mean by elasticity in relation to this opposition and heresy. Yeah. So by elasticity, which I think I see is sort of both a, a term that you could either accept or reject, but an, an attendant kind of phenomenon, which I think you can't reject. So elasticity, I, by that I mean, it's this kind of ability to resolve the heresy or the opposition while still retaining some kind of cohesive salient identity for the, for the group. Um, so it's a kind of stretching without breaking, right? So very much like, like imagining a rubber band you know, it stretches, it's one, it's one object. It can be stretched to fit around all sorts of different uh, objects uh, and hold them together, but it can also be stretched to the breaking point. So elasticity is this kind of 
trait, I'm sort of arguing, that sometimes is a, it becomes a kind of inherent or inbuilt component of a religious group. So uh, I think actually Mormonism it is one of the best examples of this because you it's this notion that, you know, because they faced all those types of opposition in their earliest stages, then that that overarching plan of salvation that we mentioned becomes a particularly adaptable or in, in my term elastic kind of meaning system from then on so you have you know things uh, the example i always use because it's just really convenient would be the way in which you've got the book of mormon uh, as this kind of rigid closed sacred text it's not going to change over time but then uh, you've got the doctrine and covenants that is this kind of flexible, uh, it's still sacred text, still part of the canon, um, but it's it's literally a, typically addressing more mundane or pragmatic issues, and it's at least theoretically still open to change in the future. So it's that kind of notion, it's that balancing act uh, of being rigid in the service of a stable identity, but being flexible also in the service of a stable identity if that if you can incorporate changes and opposition then you can maintain your identity thank you adam and people can learn more about that idea of elasticity by checking out the lecture that you delivered here at byu it's called crisis converted and depending on when people are listening they'll be able to see that on the maxwell institute's youtube page today we we spoke with adam j powell about his book irenaeus joseph smith and God making heresy. Thanks so much for taking the time to be with us today. Yeah, thank you.